Hey friends, slight delay on bringing you this webcast, but I'm glad you're now with us and we're up and running here to talk about Proposal 2. I'm Devin Skilly coming to you from our downtown studios. Very happy to have with me Katie Fahey, who is the uh, executive director of Voters Not Politicians. And on the other side of the table is Tony Daunt. He's the executive director of the Michigan Freedom Fund. And when we're talking about Proposal 2, which you'll find on your ballot here coming up uh, in just about, in fact, four weeks from today, as a matter of fact, will be Election Day. Uh, this is uh, the gerrymandering uh, bill. You may not appreciate the, the phrasing of calling it gerrymandering necessarily, <laughs> but okay, let me start with you because this really all did start with you. You uh, uh, very gr this is the almost definition of grassroots, uh, but you looked around at the way that districts were formed and cut, and uh, you decided this didn't look right to you. Yeah, I accidentally started this with a Facebook post back in 2016. <laughs> um, uh, you and your big mouth, right? Yes, exactly. Um, I had always cared about politics, especially local politics. I was really passionate about the Kent County Drain Commissioner race in 2016, but didn't have a political background. Who wasn't excited about yeah. the Kent County <laughs> Drain Commissioner race? <laughs> um, and, uh, and in 2016, I saw a lot of my friends and family who normally don't pay attention to politics actually paying attention. Yeah. And I really think that was thanks to uh, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at what do those candidates have in common, I actually think their core message had something in common. The drain the swamp and the political revolution. Yes, yes. I've and, argued so many times they were opposite uh, sides of, a, of, of the same coin. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I really saw. And seeing friends and family actually be engaged and excited, um, to me, that message really meant that we're unhappy with the status quo. Mm -hmm. We don't feel like we're mm -hmm. being listened to. A lot of people don't feel like they're being heard. And then Michigan in the primaries voted for Bernie and in the general voted for Donald Trump. And to me, a candidate can make some change, but really with the state of politics right now, you have to get to the systemic changes that to actually make as large of an impact to actually drain the swamp or have the political revolution. And gerrymandering, I remember learning about in elementary school, yes. seems like right. one of those things to start fixing so that we can have fair and not rigged elections. So it seems to you then that, that part of what is giving us the system that we have uh, is that we keep building it on our existing system. Yeah, I really think that politicians don't have a lot of incentive to give themselves less power, and right now they're the ones in charge of this system, yeah. making it so that we have non-competitive elections or so they can pick and choose who their voters are. And I think the more we're just sitting and fine with that, the more they'll continue to do yeah. that. But thankfully in Michigan we have the ballot initiative process where you can write constitutional language, yeah. gather signatures, and then have the general public vote on do we want to change this or not. So, Tony, it's interesting. If you look at the way that most elections go in Michigan, and certainly the last time, the Republican-Democratic vote is about 50-50 in our state. And yet, when you look at our legislature, uh, it's more like two-thirds Republican was the way that the votes came out. Um, if we have equal numbers of voters, uh, and we're not really operating on the Electoral College when it comes to the state legislature, okay. You would expect we would have equal numbers of representatives of the parties, wouldn't you? I mean, isn't that proof then that there's something not quite right with the way our districts are carved? No, you surprise. I'm sure you're surprised. I would actually I, dis I, disagree really, with you that. You don't think so? Um, All right. <laughs> you know, I, you know, Michigan um, certainly is is generally a competitive state. Mm -hmm. um, we we have uh, Donald Trump won won the state for president in 16, first time. A Republican had done that since 1988, right? And um, but we've had Republican governor for the last eight years. We've had a Republican Secretary of State for the last 24 years, mm -hmm. and a Republican Attorney General for the last 16 years, and um, those you know those are statewide races and lines. The only line that matters there is the border, mm -hmm. and um, I think that um, the way people live, how they disperse themselves, how they choose to live, um, has a lot to do with how the votes end up being dispersed. And um, I think it's, it's just kind of a distraction um, to the real issue of um, why, you know, why is this a bad idea? Well, then let's, let me zoom out then. Instead of moving into the way that the results worked, if I just look, and we've got a bunch of maps here in front of us of the way that the districts look, if I just look at some of these districts, and I live in the 13th district, which is a very strangely 
uh, run a district that runs from uh, Pontiac all the way down to Southfield, cuts through parts of Detroit and then down into the Gross Points. Um, but I live a couple of blocks away from people who are in a different district, and I live 45 minutes away from people who are in my district. Uh, if I just look at the way that some of these are carved out, maybe doesn't doesn't that define what gerrymandering looks like to me? You know, I'm, I'm certainly you know I'm not I'm not haven't been part of uh, you know I don't defend the totality of the current system, but um, you know there are standards in particular related to how the lines are drawn, yeah. uh, both at the federal level and at the state level. And uh, in particular here in Michigan, we focus on the, the county is kind of the primary building block based on the APOL standards uh, mm -hmm, named after mm -hmm. a gentleman who was appointed uh, special master of drawing the lines in, in the early 80s. And you, you minimize the county breaks, you minimize the municipal breaks within counties if you have to, yeah. and then you minimize precinct break, breaks. Um, and so, you know, you'll notice as you get further into the more populated areas, that's where you're going to have more lines. You know, and ultimately, uh, because we have to do this based on population, there will be a line somewhere. And it doesn't matter um, if we have the current system or this system, there are going to be lines somewhere. You've heard that, uh, I'm, I'm sure, a number of times. Uh, of course, it's going to be messy. We have to draw the line someplace, and this is how they work out. I'm going to guess you've also, I don't know if anybody's had maybe the courage to say this to you face to face, but I know there are people in rooms maybe away from you saying, grow up. This is the way the system works. Those who are in power have always drawn lines to their advantage, and the other side always complains. Democrats have done it. Republicans have done it. Yeah, well, so actually there's six other states who don't have it where politicians are drawing these lines. And in those states, you see more competitive elections. You see new people getting into candidacy. Is that what, is that, should, should that be a part of our interest? Should we say we need competitive elections or is that maybe not the right litmus test? I think if the people of Michigan live in areas where they have a competitive seat, it should reflect that. But okay. for our congressional seats, they've been drawn so that we haven't had any seat change in the last eight years. And then there were some emails uncovered about how the last system was done that say that they were designed that way by the, in this case, Republican Party, mm -hmm. purposely trying to make it non-competitive. And so even when we talk about competitive, though, we're actually talking about incumbents, the people who are already in office. Gerrymandering provides them a benefit because, let's say I was in office and you were running against me, but you weren't in office. If I knew where you lived, about three months before the election, I could draw your house out of the district. Mm -hmm, and then, mm -hmm. if it's, especially if it's the local level, then you have to go run in a brand new race. And that's not fair. Of course, I'm going to rig it in my favor to try and win. Um, but it doesn't have to be done that way. And actually, in Michigan, uh, our Constitution has an older version of a bipartisan committee that was only removed because of our legislators deciding yeah. that they wanted the power instead. Now, some, I guess, would argue that if it's not competitive in within a district, that what that means is, yeah, we're, we've managed to find a way to draw this line so that we're all, I am with my neighbors. I am just like these other people in my district. I'm for this candidate. So doesn't that speak to a certain, maybe against competitiveness, that that is getting the lines drawn correctly? And it's okay if we do end up with non-competitive elections, mm -hmm. but if you just look at the pure evidence of how these are drawn, this is not how we would define our communities. As Tony was mentioning, these are drawn based on county lines, but when you go to buy your house, you're probably thinking about things like school districts, where you go to work, your surrounding neighborhood. Yeah. Those are the things that you probably think of when you think of community. Mm -hmm. And those are probably the things and uh, opinions you want represented in Lansing and then in Washington. And so when the lines are only being based on, are you a Democrat or a Republican so we can make this competitive or not, it loses those common sense reforms that look after things like our roads, like our education, like clean water which both parties have failed to address in Michigan when they've had the power of this line drawing. It, so Tony, that is an interesting thing. I believe, if I think I've got this right, in our last election cycle, I don't believe any of our congressional races were decided by less than 10 points, uh, which is kind of a wipeout in, in, in the political world to win by double digits. Um, and that does feed this idea that we don't pick our, our, our political, voters don't pick our politicians, politicians pick their voters. And, and I, I, I'll trust your, your recollection on those I numbers. Think that's right. um, I think that's and, right. And you know, certainly um, there are seats where um, e each party wins handily. Uh, and you know, that's, again, that's based a lot on how people self-select where they live. Um, but you know, again, 
there may be a better way of doing this. And uh, I'm, I'm very skeptical of, uh, of government what? and politicians. <laughs> I'm a conservative, uh, liberty, freedom-minded guy. And uh, the folks that we work with um, through the Michigan Freedom Fund are all very skeptical of government. We want less government. And right. The, the, well, in the fact, then, is, let, then let's start to dig into her remedy, because the remedy would be to put in non-politicians. These are citizens, which I guess you could say, if you want, this is creating more government. That uh, they're, they're, but, but I think that she would, I don't want to put the words in your mouth, but I think the counter argument is these are real regular voters who are going to help decide this through common sense rather than the people that are already enmeshed and maybe strangled inside the system. And, and again, I, you know, I think it's worth, it's worth having a conversation of what that would look like. Yeah. But it's very clear that this is not the solution. That because what? Is, what, what, is, what is what is it about it that, that bothers you? There's the, the, numerous things. Uh, the, the 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 main. I mean, for, particularly the remedy. The, yeah, the, the way this, that these it, new districts would be drawn. Uh, th this solution is costly. It is unaccountable. It's complex, and it's unfair. And. Um, you know, I'll take those maybe in reverse order, and okay. I don't, I don't want to uh, take the entirety of the time. Well, take, um, you know, take one at a time, and I'll let Katie go at each one as you, as you get. So, so you know, from, from an unfair standpoint, for you, you know, mentioned the issue of um, uh, regular people and, and voters, and mm -hmm. this, this purports to get people civically engaged. Um, but when you look at the language, this prohibits people who are already civically engaged. Who, and I'm not talking people who mm. are state legislators, state senators, congressmen and women. I'm talking about people who are, they, they serve, they're a precinct delegate for their party, or they serve on their local executive uh, party committee, Democrat yeah. or Republican. Yeah. And it prohibits them from participating if they have been in that position for, I believe it's six years. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, maybe it, it is laudable to try and protect this system from politicians. But these are folks who are just doing this because they care, because they want to be part of the solution, they want to be engaged. And not only are they prohibited, but family members of them are prohibited. Parents, spouse, children, and if you have step-parents or step-children, they are prohibited by virtue of what you do. My mom was party to the lawsuit um, at the Supreme Court because she was uh, offended by, by that very aspect of it, that because of what I do, I, I, I'm a partisan guy, I love it, I, I love mixing it up. Yeah. Um, but you know, the most political thing she's ever done, I think, is, you know, uh, knock doors when my, when my dad ran <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, I, I think that that is a fundamentally unfair way, and it really well, runs counter to the fairness take, argument. Take, take a whack at that first. I think it's interesting. Uh, there's a, uh, there's some, certainly something admirable about saying we're going to get regular people involved. But uh, there's two ways to look at that, and I guess one of them is we have professional people who really understand this stuff that maybe we should not leave them out. But what do you think? So politicians don't go to redistricting school. Um, <laughs> they still pay <laughs> lobbyists and special interests to look at all the political data they use when running for elections to basically tell them how these lines should be drawn. Um, regular politicians don't know how to use the computer programming, and this commission will actually be able to uh, have the funding to make sure they can hire the expertise and the really great part about that is that it'll all be done out in the open. Right now, nobody's invited into that process except for the politicians or the political parties mm -hmm. who are in charge of it. So it excludes everyone else from having any kind of input. Um, nobody on this commission, although we have requirements to make sure that the greatest conflicts of interest can actually be the 13 commissioners, this commission will be required to do 10 public hearings before they can even start looking at the maps. And any person in Michigan could go to those meetings and actually have their voice heard. We actually require that the commission will respond to all comments that are given too. There's no part of that in the existing system at all. Uh, are you, the other uh, was it the other one was it, uh, the next one was exp uh, the expensive yeah it, the co complex um, oh compl is complexity one. yes and, sorry um, that that gets to the the fact that this proposal is seeking to add around thirty two hundred words to the Michigan Constitution mm -hmm. and if you look at the Declaration of Independence the U S Constitution and the Bill of Rights the first ten amendments obviously that we all know um, they are a combined sixty three hundred and change words and so. The three, the three main documents of that found this country and that we base our, our system on, this is fully one half of that. And there's going to be mistakes in there. There's going to be um, unintended consequences. And putting this in the Constitution is, is a dangerous experiment because, as we all know, it's very difficult to change things mm -hmm. in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. It was set up that way. It should and, be. And it should be. Right. And um, what they have done 
through um, through Ms. Fahey's group is, is, you know, kudos to them. This is the process. It's set up a certain way. Uh, you know, they should be commended for, for following that process. But, uh, you know, now we have the choice before us, is it good for Michigan? And the answer is very clearly no. Is it the... Uh I don't know if you've had any misgivings since you first put all this out there and now it's on the ballot and now you've traveled the state and heard from people, but is it overly complex? Could you have made it, could you have simplified the process a little bit in the wording? I don't think it is overly complex. Um, with the constitutional amendment, we had to do two things. We had to remove the power from the current legislature and we also had to give uh, the rules for how this commission will operate. Thankfully, there's six other states who have implemented this and we've been able to learn the different ways that politicians have still tried to corrupt those systems. Um, in Michigan, I think... Yeah, of those other six states, and yeah. I haven't really done a drill down here, has it been successful, do you feel? It has. So you see that people, you see newer people getting into politics because incumbents can't protect their seats. You also saw um, in one state the approval rating for their in-state legislature before the lines was 9%. And then after the new lines were drawn, it went up to 40%. So people are actually that's being size. happier with yeah, their representation. Yes. It's still under 50% that but, people are happy but that's, with. No, but that says a lot. I mean, 40%, uh, I, I, what state is that? California. California, where 40% the, of the people are happy with the state legislature. Yeah, now. and the Democrats were the right. ones who were gerrymandering the Republicans there. And also they did a survey to the citizens. because they legalized weed in California? <laughs> they're all happy now? I don't know. That, yeah, <laughs> correlation isn't causation, so <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right, your, your next one, uh, let's get to the expense of it. You think this is too expensive? Yeah, I think that, and again, I mentioned previously regarding the complexity, the issue of some mistakes in there. And I've read through this thing numerous times, you know, getting trying to understand it, get a hold of, of what it was attempting to do. And it took a number of attempts or, you know, read-throughs before mm -hmm. I thought, you know, it talks about a minimum of what this budget should be. Uh, it talks, you know, a minimum of 25% of the Secretary of State's yeah. um, general fund budget, which, you know, is around five, that would equal to about five, five and a half million dollars. Um, a minimum of what the commissioner should be paid. Nowhere in there does it talk about what the maximum is. And that's that's either a mistake or it was written that way on purpose. And I, well, let's either that, one let's is disqualified. one of the authors here. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, Thomas Jefferson, what did you mean when you wrote that? When you're changing the Constitution, you have to make a law that's going to be good for decades to come. So we don't know what the price of being able to compensate these uh, commissioners will be in 40 years, but we needed to make a law that would be flexible over time. Um, the other thing is that right now, our government has used the tool of underfunding things to make them unsuccessful and still put their own political will in front of this. Our Michigan governor technically right now has the right to look at any commission and decide how much money it gets and decide what its responsibilities are. So we needed to make sure that we were going to protect this commission so it could actually be independent and not have the politicians who have every reason to try and game it make sure they didn't have the ability to do it. The other really important part is that we have no idea what the current redistricting prices are because our government, our legislator, actually makes it so that we can't use the Freedom of Information Act to find that out. Mm. Um, and this commission will have to follow that. Everything that they report, there's strict spending guidelines. They'll have to work within the limits, and anything they don't use will be returned. Do you think you have an idea of how much work this will, how much of a commitment this will require of someone? Yeah, and we, what we saw in some states is that when you don't compensate the commissioners at all, that really makes it exclusionary to working class people. So making can't afford to go do. You can't afford to go do it. And that is really important because we want people on this commission who can listen to diverse communities and understand their concerns and make sure they can, you know, talk to people in the UP as well as Metro Detroit and make decisions that reflect what the will of the people is. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we wanted to make sure that they were compensated for that. It will be, you know, it'll be probably after work. They'll be needing to drive around the state to listen to people. And it'll probably be about a two-year process for them. And Tony, your last concern with it was? The, the unaccountability aspect of it but I but I, I don't want to let go of that cost issue either though because it is you know there are ways if you are interested in having a maximum um, to protect the taxpayers you know it again it it, it is important to protect processes uh, from politicians um, you know both sides do it they seek to maximize benefit um, for their for their own side um, but there is nothing in here that protects the taxpayer from from rogue spending and you know okay maybe they can put something 
back in if they don't spend it, but there's nothing in there. If they sp if you've already spent it, you can't put it back First in. First rule of government, uh, um, yeah. government funding <laughs> give them a, give spend them maximum, everything you've been right. given, right? Give them a maximum because I think we see government will take mm. every penny they can and they'll spend it. And uh, what do you, how, yeah, how do you address that? Um, we actually do have uh, provisions on how they can spend it. So it has to be spent on expertise for the panel. Uh, it, in the constitutional amendment, we spell out how it can be used, and we put restrictions on, like, you know, they can't spend X number of dollars over for food and things like that. So they'll mm -hmm. have to follow mm -hmm. the already in-place guidelines for the Secretary of State workers that already exist, too. Um, and. I think the cost to the general people, we, when we've estimated it out, it should be about 11 cents, so returning a pop can and a penny, that's what I like saying, pop can and a penny, a year for Michiganders to have fair, impartial, and transparent elections, when right now we have basically bought and paid for by special interest elections that are rigged and make it so that some votes count more and some votes count less. Uh, to Katie's point that this really does speak in a way to what we saw in the Trump success and the Bernie Sanders success, this idea of we got to clean out the swamp, we got to get rid of all of these established, uh, rusted ways of doing business. I mean, isn't that, doesn't that, uh, you, you, can you see a little bit of something attractive in that? I, I'm I'm very much in favor of making sure that politicians are responsive to our to our demands, and that there is transparency in yeah. government. Um, the, the The bottom line, though, is uh, again the the cost, the accountability, unaccountability. Um, th this is, you know, these are with in all respect to, to to Katie. You know, these are claims being made by the people who are supportive of it, and I don't know of any government program that has ever spent less than what it was provided or that hasn't taken the chance to spend more than than we have allotted them and i i think that putting this in the constitution is is a mistake because it's 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 a theory of that this will make things work better and putting it in the constitution is is dangerous and uh, we virtually like Katie responded to that the idea that this is a theory that, that we're going to test, and by it's, our test is going already right into the Constitution. It's not. This is a proven concept across the country. Um, there's actually four ballot initiatives uh, in Missouri, uh, Utah. Um, and Colorado, as well as Michigan this year, with very similar concepts, as well as the states that have already adopted these things. We took a lot of time and thousands of people, actually, their input on making sure that we put a really intentional policy together. Um, and if anything, this is restoring our constitution that used to be there, that had a commission there, that when the Michigan Supreme Court went to the legislature to re-talk about, the legislature said, no, nah, we'd like the power of drawing those yeah. lines again and not having the people in charge. And so if anything, um, the other really important part about putting it into the constitution is it makes it very clear, black and white, on what the rules should be. Technically, there are standards right now that are not followed, mostly because it's done behind closed doors and they're more suggestions than actual law. And this will make it so that those criteria have to be followed. Otherwise, that commission is redrawing that map. It actually adds accountability for us, the voters, to ensure it's done in a way that takes into account Republicans, Democrats, independents, people from northern Michigan and southern. Tony, would, wouldn't the process help from a little, with a little bit of sunlight on it? Because uh, these the, usually the way these are drawn, it does feel very cryptic and sort of uh, done in a smoke-filled room. We are very much supportive of in increased transparency in, in government, that, whether that be the applying FOIA to the legislature, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, applying mm -hmm. it to the executive office, regardless of party, they work for us. I think we're very much in, in alignment on that, that the politicians work for us, and it shouldn't be the other way around. And How would you fix, then, this these districts that I look at that seem so strangely drawn, or do you not think there is anything that needs to be addressed? I, th I think that is an easy, um, catchy thing to point to, is how they look. Uh, but when you look at lines throughout this country, there's they are going to be oddly shaped throughout the what's country. What's wrong with a grid? And what's wrong with a grid system? How, if, if we were to just, um, as, as near as we could population-wise, to get as many people together in a district that just sort of looked like a grid. Uh, we've gotten so far away from that. What's wrong with a grid? I think, again, that's something worth talking about. And there's a, Iowa um, has a model that is, I think, what would be really worth talking about because of the fact that it, it is kind of based on on a grid system and then it does not take the power completely out of 
the people, out of the elected representatives. They still have a say. We still have the ability to hold people accountable for the lines because the legislature votes on them, the governor signs them. With this process, and this is the unaccountability, this is 13 individuals randomly selected by the Secretary of State to serve on this commission, and ultimately we as, as voters, we have no ability to hold them accountable, and that mm -hmm. would be hold them accountable for not showing up to the meetings, hold them accountable for malfeasance, hold them accountable for spending more money than they're yeah, supposed yeah. to. Okay, that's actually the last thing I wanted to talk about, was uh, I, I, I have a certain skepticism of, of government by referendum, and <laughs> constantly mm -hmm. turning things, it sounds great to turn things over to people, but you know, Edmund Burke said now more than 200 years ago, an elected official owes his constituents not only their representation, but his better judgment as well. And he betrays them if he uh, defers it to their opinion. And I think that there's, there's, there's something to that, the idea that we need, that, that we elect officials to do these things for it. We elect people that would not necessarily do it the way we would do it. I, I go to a restaurant, I don't, wanna, I don't want them to cook the steak the way I would do it. I want them to apply their expertise to the steak. And that, and that w we should expect our politicians to be uh, the professionals who understand and do our do our bidding for us with our, our better uh, uh, notions in mind. I'm starting to wander around like Alex Trebek <laughs> in that debate the other night, with, going on and on about this. But 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 that we need to expect them to be. Um, we need to defer to the judgment that we are electing. We're electing them as a as an intellect as well as a representative. I don't know that many people in Michigan think that their representatives are accountable to them. I think a lot of mm. people feel like there's no accountability. We have people who don't show up to meetings. We have people who don't want to listen to half their constituents because they didn't vote for them. We have politicians who are taking more meetings with businesses and moneyed interests than with their actual constituents. And the legislature hasn't fixed this. That's actually why we need to use the referendum process. There's been over 11 different bills introduced on redistricting, but when Democrats were in charge of the process, it was only introduced by Republicans. Yeah. When Republicans were in charge, it was only introduced by Democrats, and none of those were even ever brought up for a vote. Our legislature has continuously chosen to do nothing about this, probably because it would be giving themselves less power. They have a huge conflict of interest, and I think there's a lot of examples where we don't let uh, you know uh, one team referee a baseball game or you do want you know some you want to reduce that conflict of interest Drew Carey's cousin can't be on the price is right because there could be some fishy business going on with that and that's where I think when you talk to people I've talked to people across the state about this we have volunteers in all 83 counties and no matter where I go when people find out that their politician gets to choose whether they want them to be their voter or not, whether they like the way that we personally vote or not, yeah. there's something fundamentally wrong with that because we're supposed to be the ones electing them, not not them choosing which voters should be theirs. I, I gave you the first word, Tony. I'll let you have the last word. Respond to that, especially this idea that in you know in baseball we don't let one team umpire the game. And I I want to commend you on the Edmund on the Burke. Edmund Burke. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> nicely done. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that um, it, people are rightly skeptical of politicians and of both parties. And we should have a conversation about how best to fix this process. But ultimately, when you look at the language of this proposal, when you look at the, the for all intents and purposes, the blank check that it is writing to do this process, yeah. at the unaccountability that is inherent with it in terms of the people who are on the commission and our inability to remove them, to vote them off, to do anything except go to a meeting and possibly yell at them. Um, the complexity and the um, unfairness, it, those combined are, make it bad from a policy standpoint. To throw it in, to put it in the Constitution and hope it works, I think is is the final. It should be the final straw in in terms of people's decision. I, I hope you guys feel like we got to a lot of different things there because that felt like a really uh, a fascinating conversation to me Absolutely. anyway. And I'm going to have to post a picture of me now in, in front of the Edmund Burke statue in Dublin, <laughs> which uh, I have somewhere. I'll have to find it. But thank you both very much for being here. This really, uh, I, I think it's a great issue to debate. And it'll ultimately, of course, be up to you. Uh, that is uh, everything that's going on behind uh, Proposal 2. Uh, and I, I, I hope we've uh, shed a little bit of light on it for you. Thanks, guys, both of you.
for being here. And thank, thank you. you for being here as well. We'll see you later on tonight for Local 4 News coming up at 11 over on the broadcast side.